101 Art. And secondly to that, I'd also say I'd like to say a big thank you to Alphapex. They are manufacturers of Litecoin and Dogecoin miners. They are down at D4. D1, you will find 101 Art. D4, you will find Alphapex. Head down there, see these guys. They want to talk to you. See the, meet the team and get them connections. Now, up next, ladies and gentlemen, we have the fireside chat for top global crypto funds. This is a very interesting one for you guys. Keep a listen out. Let's invite on stage managing partner of DWF Labs, Andre Jekev, Grakchev, Daniel Carlucci, founder and CEO of Morningstar Ventures, Barev Barvik Pavel, Pavel, CIO of Arrington Capital, and Sergey Hitroth, founder and list listings dot help, Jets Capital, and Blockchain Life. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is our panel discussion with the top crypto funds, and today we'll try to learn all secrets of crypto investing. And first of all, uh, could you introduce yourself and say it about the main focus of your fund? Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrei Grachev. Uh, I'm a managing partner of DWF Labs. Uh, yeah, we do market making, we, we do venture and liquid investments in crypto in different areas, but uh, with the main focus on DeFi uh, infrastructure, derivatives, and some social related stuff like game, fire, memes, and cetera. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Danilo. I run Morningstar Ventures. I think this is my third blockchain life, so congratulations on the growth. Really exciting to see that, and that's kind of the power of Dubai. Um, we are based here in the UAE for the last um, four years or so, so we've been one of the main uh, active investors here in the space. And uh, yeah, super excited to be here. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Bavik Patel. Uh, I'm CIO of Arrington Capital. Uh, the fund has two parts. There's the venture side, which looks at early stage investments. Um, and then there's a liquid side to the business as well, uh, which trades all the liquid portfolio. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. OK, let's start. Uh, first, um, simple question. How do you feel about current crypto market? Are uh, we are in uh, the beginning of bull run, or middle, or in the end? Who says awesome. we're in the bull run? <laughs> well, from my side, yeah, I think we are in a bull run. Um, this reminds me very much uh, of like four years ago. I was in London. Happening was happening. People had, you know, great expectations of that specific moment. But the market was pretty similar to where we are right now in the stage. There was early anticipation and growth about six months before the actual happening. Then the happening itself, nothing really happened. The blockchain stayed up, you know, the world didn't change or didn't go under. And then about six months to four, to four to six months after the actual event is when the next wave came. So I think nothing's pretty different this time. Um, you know, there's a political situation going on right now as well that's affecting everything. So hopefully that will somewhat be solved. And um, yeah, I think we will, we will dip or we will stay where we are right now and then hopefully things will be better in a few months. If I take a step back and I look at, say, the, the bigger macro picture, right? Um, we had a year last year where there were an incredible amount of rate increases, more than probably a generation almost of traders, investors hadn't seen. There was a decade of dollar rates being close to, close to zero, right? It almost became like 
a rounding error, what, what interest you received in your savings um, accounts. And we've gone from that to a world where, let's say, dollar rates are 5%, right? And we saw that increase last year. And the thoughts that everyone's had over the last few months, let's just say, is how many rate cuts are there going to be this year, right? So if we look at that big macro picture as a background, given the fact that, let's say, the rates asset classes, we're a growing asset class, crypto is. However, we're, we've got to be looking at the bigger picture as well from that macro perspective. And then you look at all other risk assets along the way. And you've got, say, equities along the way as well, which have also super high levels, right? Um, and then you look at, say, so let's say you look at the rates world and you had a fairly high interest rate environment for the last 10 years. Then you've got equities, which are, say, from a price perspective, just a pure price perspective, at super highs. And then you look at, let's say, the crypto world, and let's say you look at, say, Bitcoin, and we're at highs, right? We've had a sort of small pullback over the last few days, but I think you can look at various parameters there, and whether you can get a feel for, say, the, the leverage in the system, and how you look at that leverage in the system, right? So whether it's futures versus cash basis for people who are trading on a, on a liquid book, right? Or you're looking at, say, valuations of companies if you're on the venture side, right? We're definitely, we're definitely not at the start. <laughs> um, and I think everyone in this room would not want us to be at the top, right? However, I think we've got to be mindful of the fact that when we've got a certain amount of leverage in the system, you are going to get volatility. That's just default. Um, and you're going to get pullbacks. That's natural. So I say we're somewhere in between. I think we have to be cognizant of the bigger picture. That's yeah. my view. Yeah. From my point of view, I think we, yes, we are uh, in the bull run. Uh, and we successfully passed the first wave of this bull run. And we see that uh, Bitcoin and some other assets reached the new all-time high. But if you take a look at uh, the whole picture, a little bit behind prices, you will see that, uh, for example, what people search in uh, Google, this number of requests about crypto or about Bitcoin uh, hasn't reached uh, all-time high yet. The, 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 there is a kind of big, big upside. Normal people, yes, they know, they hear about it, but they are not so massively involved, even comparing with 2021. Despite the prices are almost around 2021 all-time high. Then we also don't have Ethereum ETF narrative played. From my point of view, it should be approved, I think, this year. And then it will boost the whole market again, and especially boost media coverage. Uh, and media will push and motivate people to go to the crypto, make money, buy Bitcoin, buy ETH, then sell it, and then this money flow will be distributed to altcoins and to other assets, right? And also, also, we need to see, from my point of view again, right, uh, some correction. Because we reached all-time high, yes, price is corrected, but we also have halving. We also should see some delays of Ethereum ETF, some disputes around it, and it should be like a little bit, you know, nervous, right? But a lot of funds invested, like hundreds of millions, even billions, right? A lot of money deployed, a lot of products are building, right? VC activity is very high. I think uh, we will see at least one more wave of this market, but then who knows? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. But I believe that uh, maybe a real bull market will start uh, when a lot of big projects with a large Web2 audience will enter in the market. Because I think that uh, right now we have not got a lot of new retention users. Okay, I agree with you that uh, we are in the early stage in a bull run, but uh, I think we will see a real bull run when a lot of uh, big projects will enter in the market, like for example, Stepan, like it's a 
it, it, when it will be like a really big mass adoption for crypto. And my question for you, uh, what is your investment strategy and uh, how do you select the project? Because here, a lot of crypto investors, and I think uh, they would like to know this information. Because here, you are really one of the biggest crypto funds. I can, I can give a quick overview, maybe from a from an Arrington overall perspective. Um, our investment strategy is mainly focused on early stage. Um, we've got a founders first approach. Um, what I mean by that is we look for exceptional founders who are deeply passionate about what they're building. Um, they want to build a team around them which has got the relevant technical expertise. Um, and they're working on ideas which are going to have a large market and add long-term value to the ecosystem. These are the sorts of things we care about. Um, in addition to that, I'd say it's, it's vital that they build a community around them, especially in this space. Um, so a lot of these projects. So that's the sort of things we look at on the, on the VC side of the business. Um, we also have, also have a liquid side of the business, which is quite different, um, and it's more active trading on the markets. Yeah, <clears throat> on our end, um, so, you know, we, we manage our private money, we never raise any outside capital, so on our end, let's say, we have a more fluid approach where, of course, there's a, a strategy around it, but um, we can sometimes take bets that are, uh, you know, maybe not 100% focused on, you know, making a lot of money or making some kind of money, but just strategic bets, whether it's um, specific bets in a sector that where we want to learn more or a sector where we feel we're very experienced in. So not all our investment decisions are, are driven by a, a financial incentive. Um, also, um, we just really like to you know, spend a lot of time with the projects we work on. So a founder first approach, as you mentioned, is very much our approach as well. Um, when we pick a team, uh, we consider very much who the introducer was. I think that's very important. Um, it's like a big filter, so we, we barely make any, uh, you know, investments that are coming inbound. Most of the investments we make uh, are referred to us by people who we trust. And uh, when we pick bets and we are the first investor into a team, we always, uh, you know, ask the opinions of others to, to kind of, you know, um, certify our belief in, in a team. And I think it's very important because, uh, you know, we've made mistakes. Uh, we have, um, you know, been lucky a few other times. You know, you mentioned Steppen, for example, that was also one of our portfolio companies. Um, and then, you know, yeah, as an investor, you, you, you get lucky sometimes, uh, other times uh, you don't, and um, you know, you're never the smartest in the room. So it's always important to, to ask for advice and, 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 and see what's up. Um, yeah, I, I also agree that uh, Founders First is the best approach, right? It's like a cornerstone of every decision because uh, I think we and other funds, we invest in I would say first in people, then in technologies or a product or ideas, right? Because uh, behind every idea, behind every technology, we should have like a team that could execute it and that could build it, right? And uh, that should be trusted. Uh, then behind this, right? The technology or a project, uh, it should be relevant to a market and it should have like a long-term vision and long-term plans that should be aligned with uh, market narratives and with market uh, development for the development, right? For example, now we see that the trend is institutionalization and also retail-driven market, right? And also big, big players are coming to here, right? And projects that would be able to serve this flow, in theory, they should be successful, right? But at least uh, some of them. And uh, of course, uh, this is a possibility uh, to in engage like largest audiences, right? Because product is good, right? But people should understand the landscape of a crypto market, right? Partners, uh, tools how to build here, right? Tools who, how to communicate things here, right? And who is the right partner, who is not, right? And to build to push it forward, of course. And uh, risk management is very important. 
Uh, I also agree that sometimes we also invest in projects that uh, are relevant for our portfolio that could be like flat or not very profitable for us like investments, but uh, very profitable for us like, you know, uh, like for ecosystem, right? To support another portfolio companies in our eco. Yeah, and some room if regarding how we make decisions, right? It's also very risky, but uh, with very potential large rewards, right? But it's more about risk management of the fund than about venture decisions, right? Kind of like this. Thank you. But in our fund, we have got several hundreds criteria for analysis uh, project. And I think one year ago, we tried to we try to select the most basic one, and we use 96 main criteria. And I agree with you that founders and team people, it's one of the main uh, criteria. But uh, maybe let's talk about economics. Uh, right now on the internet, a lot of uh, advice how you need to analyze the economics. Yes, it's really good that crypto investor becomes smarter every new cycle. And my question for you, uh, when you analyze uh, economics, uh, what crypto investor need to pay attention to? I think uh, uh, there are two types of projects, right, that's uh, relevant for a crypto market, right? The first one is uh, with very, very aggressive tech economy, right, uh, with unlocks on TG, like a part of unlock, right? I would say that this is more for uh, cash-driven and middle-term driven investors because when market is bullish, you invest, you get some token CTG, right? And you can liquidate and get your principal back like almost immediately. I mean, within one year or like a few months, right? It works on crypto market or bull market, but uh, in long, long term, it is uh, not always sustainable, right? In long run, this approach is more risky in terms of token performance. Then the second type uh, is a bit different, right? If you see the big, big launch, launches, uh, it's usually like 12 to 24 months uh, lockup period, and then like a few years uh, uh, monthly wasting, right? Uh, in terms of investors' interest, right? It is uh, more profitable for long run, but you should have uh, like more cash uh, to invest, right? I would say both approaches works, but depends on the project scale. And if you want to build something like really, really big and long term, second approach from my point of view is more relevant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so my background is is Web two, and you know, ideally, fundraising in Web three um, should follow the same approach of Web2 because fundraising, in the end, you're telling a story, right? So when we get involved early in a project, um, what matters to us or the questions that we ask is, first of all, how much money do you need to, to bring your product to life? Um, so when it comes to token metrics, it's, it's all a question of thinking backwards. You know, how many rounds uh, will there be in total? Uh, how much money do you need? What's your burn rate? You know, how long can you survive with this, with this kind of funding? And then uh, making sure that the project doesn't sell too many tokens, uh, but just about enough. Uh, and then having so room for flexibility, right? If, if things go wrong and the team has raised not enough money, is there still, let's say, the, the, the adaptability to maybe make a new round of funding to, to go through the bear or something like that? So it's a very, very individual question. Every project is different. Of course, we do benchmarking, right? If you're building a perp dex, you look at how much other perp dexes have raised with the expectations of where the FTB will be at when the market is live. When you look at gaming, you do you know same benchmark. So yeah, I think uh, there is no secret sauce, but uh, it's always very um, important to be super careful to to you know have adaptability of your metrics. Thank you. So I think the guys have touched on quite a number of points and. From my perspective, I think there needs to be a strong alignment between the team, the investors, and the community. Right? The, the team has a long-term vision, and they may pivot along the way. Right? Um, the investors have to be there for, for, for multi-cycles. Right? That's what you really care about when you're looking at an investor who can add value to, to, to your project. And then you need a certain amount of allocation for the, for the community as a whole. Um, to, to, to build that, so I think those are the that alignment is key here. Yeah, good. Uh, let's talk a global look, uh, Pavik. Uh, your fund is one of the biggest tier one fund in a crypto space, 
and uh, you are one of the leaders uh, in the market. And my question for you, uh, how the strategies and roles of Crypto Wales Fund uh, might evolve in the next decade? So if we, let's take the ETFs recently, right? So we've had the, the ETF launches, it's been, it's been a while now, and we've seen um, sufficient traction there. And it's been a key theme. Now, that's a spot-based ETF versus a futures-based ETF. And as more players get involved in this space, you'll see the evolution of the asset class, and you'll see different types of funds. And what I mean there is, if you went into, say, if I put my, say, traditional assets hat on for a second, you've got long onlys, long shorts, tail funds, all these different types of funds. And then you've got, say, even banks there sitting in between, which are recycling different types of risk. If I, if I take the current state, and if you switch your mindset to being thinking in crypto terms, so your unit of measurement is selling out crypto, it's not dollars or any fiat measurements, and you ignore the, the price volatility, you now, the, the immediate thing that you think of now is how do I generate this crypto that I've got, how do I allow it to grow? So some sort of, say, savings product. And once you've got people who are in that mindset, they'll want to have a sustainable way of generating yield on their crypto. And I'm not talking about short-term, very high yielding products which go away. I think there's going to be a structural shift. So let's take an asset manager now has these spot ETFs. The natural thing next it to, will be to start doing, say, overwriting on this spot ETF. So there's only a matter of time before options on these spot ETFs come up. Right? And so that's a clear example of something where large asset managers will have to offer this out to their product. It's not a case of if, it's a case of when. And that flow then will drive the volatility of that asset, will have a massive impact on the volatility there. Um, and so I think these are the sorts of changes where you will then see the, who takes the other side of that trade. And then you'll find opportunistic funds who will be coming in wanting to take on tail risk hedges and these sorts of things. So I think that's how this asset class evolves from a funds perspective. Mm, good, interesting. Andrew, Daniela, you also have got one of the biggest crypto funds in the crypto space. And my question also for you, how Wales Investing Fund will influence in the market uh, in the next 10 years? Um, okay, I mean, just, you know, you, my perspective is that, um, you know, us uh, on the other side of the table, in terms of um, asset allocators, we have to also find our niche, right? So, um, you know, each of us has to find a way to add specific value to the projects uh, we invest in with a long-term approach, right? So, you know, you were mentioning market making before. Will market making be there in five years from now? Probably yes, right? Um, that's your niche, right? Do we touch market making? No, it's not our bread and butter. So. I think what's very important um, is to find your way of how you can add capital, uh, sorry, add value to projects and then double uh, on that with a perspective where whatever you're adding value with will not be disrupted by AI in a couple of years down the line, right? So on our side, we do focus a lot on go-to-market strategies and um, you know, early stage investments. That's where we do a good work and that's where we, we keep focusing on. So I think it's important to understand the market you're in and find your your core and then stick to it uh, with the you know um, awareness uh, that whatever you're you're doing is not going to be disrupted in a few years from now Good. Yeah, um, if we make one step back from here right and let's see how we structured projects they propose some ideas right then communities uh, they play with these ideas by tokens, I know, use projects, right, and end users. And this um, triangle, there are also funds, right? And funds, uh, it is like a initial fuel for projects to build, right? Because if you are a fund, you need to uh, analyze, right, trends, future trends, and what people like. Because if you invest in things that people don't like, 
it, will, it would never go up, right? Why people will, would use it, right? And then you see, okay, projects propose this, people like this, right? Okay, I will support it, funds deploy money, and then these niches, they're starting to growing up, right? Of course, not of them are successful, and not of them would be successful, but uh, several of them will, right? And this is a role of crypto funds, and this, this was like this, and this is like this, and this will be like this. And then, as uh, Daniel said, right, each fund, every fund, every company which deploys money on the market, of course, tries to provide some additional support, additional value to its portfolio companies and uh, projects that they invest in, uh, but aligned with the main core. For example, from, my, from us, it is ecosystems like market making. From someone else, like additional fundraising, right? Or something, or technology, right? And then funds like kind of deploying money and support on cornerstone level. Then communities pick it up and push it up. Kind of like this. Yeah, it's a good answer. I think in our fund we also try to build an ecosystem like listing help, Jets Capital, Blockchain Live, this conference, market making, and some different companies. Uh, and my question for you, Daniel, uh, your fund is one of the first who invested in Stepen. Uh, Stepen is really big project for mass adoption. Yeah, it's really good. But my question for you, where did you find such a project, and why did you bet on it? Interesting. So. Uh, yeah, Stepan is an interesting one. So that was an introduction from someone whom we had done a very strong introduction to as well. That was the fifth Binance Launchpad project called Multiverse X, which I uh, brought to a friend. And then, you know, I think a year later he came back to me and said, listen, I, you brought me this, I bring you that. And this is then how it happens, right? We had a talk to the team. Uh, we were pretty much the first investor that could support the project on uh, the marketing side, and, and so that's what we focused on. And, um, you know, we were not in charge or didn't have, let's say, the influence on the project to change any metrics or do any of that. We were just one of the follow-on follow investors, and uh, we just, you know, were able to build confidence with the team and then support them very much on the go-to-market strategy. And uh, we've had a, a big impact to also, you know, uh, make the project uh, be adopted in CIS, uh, including uh, India and the remaining countries we supported. Now, you know, I, I do think Stepan is an interesting case because it was very, very much retail focused and because Stepan actually had a product and had adoption before they had a token. And I think that's something that we've learned we really like. We like when, a, when an application can be downloaded, can be used, and there can be traction before there is any you know, conversation or specificities around the token. And since then, we've, we've had a number of investments that have followed a, a similar approach. Um, we have, a f and gaming has also become specifically interesting for us, so I think we have done a good job at, at backing a lot of big gaming projects. Uh, one of them coming out soon uh, is Godzilla Games that we're very excited about. It's going to be the first uh, game on Xbox and PlayStation with a token. So that's something, you know, again, where the product speaks uh, and not the token, not the, not the money, not that side. So I think sometimes, you know, reversing, um, you know, the perspective is very important. And uh, I know there's a few other portfolio companies where, that we've brought to Blockchain Life, and I'm also proud of those. Uh, and they follow the similar approach. Build the product first, launch a token after. Thank you, it's really good. But my question for you, for all of you, what do my, what the main trends uh, do you see in the next bull run? Maybe, for example, some uh, uh, sectors uh, which uh, underwhelm it now, but have uh, really good potential in the near future. So, just off the top of my head, whether it's a AI, whether it's real world assets, chain, a lot of these have been doing well in this, in this, in this, in this run. And although from say specific projects might look rich from a valuations perspective, I think there's, you have to look at just specific projects and find value those. And I think that is what will continue, right? In, the, in, this, in this bull market run or the, or the next one. 
Uh, just briefly, I think it depends also what, uh, what adoption and success means to us, right? Uh, if we're talking about bringing uh, normies or traditional users to crypto, then we're very, very bullish on gaming. And I really uh, hope we have a you know, gaming summer uh, in a few months, just like we had DeFi summer a few years back. And that's what we're betting on uh, in terms of bringing fresh blood and fresh users to the blockchain. Uh, when it comes to increasing our market cap and increasing our adoption more on um, you know like like global also institutional level I, I think a lot about the market capitalization of the largest asset class in the world which is you know real estate we were looking at 650 trillion dollars globally and then you compare that with gold at around 12 13 trillion dollars and then you look at crypto at around you know, nearly $3 trillion, right? And so if you look at that upside that is there, of course, the tokenization of real world assets is what can bring us, you know, to the multiplier factor. But, but that's not what personally gets me the most excited. What I'm most excited about is, is uh, seeing my son in a few years using the blockchain without knowing that he's using the blockchain. And I hope gaming will be that solution. Um, I agree about gaming. This is uh, the most understandable for people, right? You need to explain how crypto works, but you don't need to explain how games work, right? It's clear for everyone. It's uh, the most engage, engageable platforms, right? Game five first, then of course real world assets because uh, BlackRock opened this door, right? But nothing came from this door yet, but it will, right? Real world assets. Then uh, layer one, layer two technologies, uh, because it is hot, and I don't see any reasons to be less hot. A lot of investments done. Uh, and third thing, third thing, I would say, from my perspective again, right, uh, it should be something related to, to deep pin, right? It is like real world assets, but when real things connected to blockchain, and we saw some things up and of course derivatives because derivatives on DeFi it is still underdeveloped and it should be developed together with moving all things from off chain to on chain. Thank you. Last uh, very quickly question. Uh, I think a lot of people in this hall would like to know this information. Uh, what do you think when future or current bull run uh, will be end. I think a lot of people think that it will be end in 2025, but another crypto investor think that our technical cycle is broken. What do you think? I think it depends on, the, on your time horizon, right? And uh, you could have various metrics for talking about drawdowns and the pullbacks, and now we're in a bear market, so and so forth, right? Um, You've got to, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're investing in companies for the long term, then you're there for, for multi-cycles, right? If you're sitting on a, on a liquid trading desk, then yes, you care about drawdowns and, and, and churn, right? So I think it just depends on your time horizon, right? So I think that gets defined first, and then you decide. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we have known to have diamond hands, and that has also you know, cost us a lot of money <laughs> and, and sweat. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying that we're gonna be doing the opposite this cycle, uh, to be clear, but we're definitely gonna be a bit more careful. And, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's better to be, um, you know, rather slightly pessimistic and, and, and more careful than to just, you know, um, yeah, just, just be too bullish and, and too, uh, too positive about what's to come. So I don't know. Uh, I wish I knew, and I think we're all guessing, but it depends very much also on, you know, political situations, the upcoming elections, there's a lot of uncertainties, um, but my take is, uh, yeah, maximum another year, maximum. I won't say any timeline, because I do believe that nobody knows it, right? But I think, oh, as I said, right, we should see a new all-time high, and when we see all-time high in terms of prices, traffic, and people's interest, it should be kind of the end of uh, bull cycle, right? But if you want to know some exact numbers, I do believe that some astrologists in this area, they could help with it. 
Yeah, it's funny. Okay, thank you so much for such interesting panel discussion, and let's applaud for our speaker. Thank you, gentlemen. Such an inspiring panel right there. Let's give them a huge round of applause. Let's show our support. If you are you. just Thank joining you. us here yeah. on main stage, once again, we have had some fantastic panels, some great keynotes. We have many, many more to come. But before we do, I'd just like to announce